Uh, I want to say thank you to Pastor Don for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak to you today. He and Audrey, are, of course, are taking a well-deserved rest. And welcome to you, all of you who are in the room today, as well as those who are joining us from your home. Today, of course, is the last Sunday of 2020. Can we get an amen? Uh, a year ago today, on the last Sunday of 2019, I announced my retirement from Groveton Baptist Church where I'd served as associate pastor for 21 years. Uh, when I first uh, moved here with my family in 1998, one of the first fellow ministers I met was Carolyn Jenkins, who was serving here at First Baptist as the uh, interim youth pastor. For those of you who don't know anything about Groveton Baptist Church, it was a church plant of First Baptist back in 1943 when a lot of people were moving to Fairfax County. What began as a church with a lot of North Carolinian transplant has now become a church uh, that's full of ethnically and economically diverse uh, group of people uh, with sister congregations in Spanish and uh, an Ethiopian congregation. My wife and I joined uh, First Baptist Church in June of this year after participating online for several weeks. Uh, our uh, son met his wife here through the uh, young adult ministry. Well, my first ministry assignment uh, as a young adult uh, right out of college was serving with the International Mission Board in Kobe, Japan uh, for two years. Uh, the uh, strong commitment this church has to the supporting international missions is one of the things that uh, attracted us to First Baptist. And again, as Don, uh, Pastor Don has shared, if you've not given yet to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, I would encourage you to do so. Well, since my retirement, I usually spend about three days a week uh, serving uh, with the Museum of the Bible in downtown Washington, D.C. I put on a costume and I help our guests ex uh, experience uh, the context of first century in a, a permanent exhibit uh, we call The World of Jesus of Nazareth. I want to give a shout out this morning to the men's Bible study group that I've been a part of since uh, joining uh, First Baptist. And I also want to give a shout out to my sister-in-law and brother-in-law who are uh, listening in in northern Michigan where they live as many of you are listening from home today. Many of you know, especially those of you who have kids, know the children's book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. So how do we know we're having a bad day? We know we're having a bad day if our birthday cake collapses under the weight of candles. Uh, for those of you who have families and are teaching your children at home this year, during a tut tutoring session, your child asks you what a synonym is and you respond that it's a spice. Uh, you know you're having a bad day if you work on Capitol Hill like uh, guys like Larry Myers and you see the 60 Minutes crew uh, in your office waiting for you. You know you're having a bad day if your twin forgets your birthday. Uh, you know you're having a bad day if you send your wife sympathy cards on your wedding anniversary and this is the very worst of all. You know you're having a bad day when your doctor tells you that you're allergic to chocolate chip cookies. Well, if we lived in the first century, we know we were having a bad day when we were arrested and stripped and beaten and thrown in jail. And that's exactly what happened to missionaries Paul and Silas. Uh, turn with me with your, in your Bibles to the chapter of Acts, or you can watch on the screen. We're going to pick up the narrative in verse 16 of the... Ch 16th chapter of Acts. But let me set some background for you first. Paul and Silas had traveled to an area that Luke calls Asia. It's a, probably an area that was on the Aegean coast of the western part of Turkey. But the Holy Spirit had directed the team not to go there. Paul had a vision to go to Macedonia, which is a region of modern-day Greece. And so responding to the uh, Holy Spirit, Paul and Silas and his team traveled into the cities of Macedonia, including the city of Philippi. In Philippi, they met a lady, uh, a lady by the name of Lydia. She was a businesswoman who was earnestly seeking the Lord. She was baptized and invited the missionary team to her home. All was well. So let's begin reading with chapter 
uh, verse 16 of chapter 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These are men that are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. But she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirits, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit spirit left her. Now, these verses describe a possessed girl who was able to understand the true nature of Paul's preaching. She was following these missionaries around saying, Most high God and way of salvation. Now, all of that sounds, uh, makes a lot of sense to those of us in an American evangelical church in 2020. But none of this would have made any sense to the Gentiles of Philippi. The Greco-Roman world was full of saviors and deliverers. In fact, the emperor himself called himself a savior. So this little girl was a big annoyance to Paul and his companions. So Paul, uh, reminiscent of Jesus' exorcism, commanded the spirit to come out of her, and of course immediately it did. And that's when the trouble began. So let's pick it up again uh, with verse 19. When her owners realized their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating unlawful customs for us Romans to accept or practice. Now, casting out a demon was one thing, Taking away someone's ability to make money is another. Sounds a little like 2020, doesn't it? When Paul and company mess with the owner of this little girl's ability to make them money, their horrible, no good, very bad day was just getting started. None of the charges that were brought against them were valid, but the charges appealed to the anti-Jewish sentiments and to the nationalistic Roman pride And they won over the magistrates. Let's pick it up again with verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. In other words, the life of the jailers depended on them securing the prisoners. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Now, for honest, most of us would say, really? They were singing and praying hymns? Now, they didn't have the Book of Common Prayer. They didn't have open windows or a version uh, devotion app. Uh, they didn't have hymnals. They didn't even have words on the screen. Yet, they were praying and singing. But this reminds us of something that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. In Philippians 3.10, it's recorded, I want to know Christ, yet to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul and Silas had made a commitment to Christ. They were going to follow Christ regardless of the difficulties. They were going to follow Christ even on those terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. We all have bad days, and some of us would say that we've had more than our share of bad days in 2020. Now, these two men had been beaten. That's not the kind of challenge most of us face, but I'm guessing that most of us know what it means to be emotionally or mentally beaten up. We were reminded what our mama said to us as teenagers, nothing good ever happens when you're not home by midnight. That's why verse 25 seems so amazing to us. 
Around midnight, Paul and Silas were complaining about their circumstances. Now, of course, that's not what it says. It says around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Now, let's be honest. When most of us are in a spiritual or emotional slump, or when we're extremely tired, usually our natural reaction is not to pray or to sing. It's common to focus on the bad day. So how do we put our terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day in perspective? How do we keep from fixating on our problems? How do we move from focusing on our problems to worship? Part of the solution is to look at the big picture. And that's what a college student did in writing this email. Dear Mom and Dad, I have so much to tell you. Because of the fire in my dorm that was set off by the student riots, I experienced temporary lung damage and I had to go to the hospital. While I was there, I fell in love with an intern, so I dropped out of school. We're going to move to Alaska where we might get married. Your loving daughter. P.S. None of this really happened, but I did flunk chemistry and I wanted to keep it in perspective. So what is our perspective? Now, there's always someone in a worse situation, and we could play the comparison game, but that might work once. But Paul and Silas demonstrated a better answer. They turned to worshiping the Lord. Now, worship is like a camera. It helps us gain perspective and refocus on the big picture. Worship helps us focus on the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. It refocuses on the fact that Jesus loves me when I least deserve it and when I least expect it. It refocuses on the fact that if we are in right relationship with Christ, we can look forward to the future no matter what our present circumstance might be. Through worship, God restores the joy of our salvation. Worship moves us from focusing on the natural to reacting supernaturally, even if it doesn't make sense. Is it easy? Absolutely not. Nothing is more difficult than praising God when everything seems to go wrong. However, I believe one of the purest forms of worship is praising God when we don't feel like it. Paul and Silas didn't feel like it. Their bodies were broken. But they chose to worship by an act of their will. They chose to worship and rise above their circumstances. Jackie Robbins says of was one of the first was the first African American to play major league baseball. He broke baseball's color barrier. He faced jeering crowds at every stadium in which he played. People would stomp on his feet and kick him. While playing one day in his home stadium in Brooklyn, he made a an error. And as he stood there at second base, Humiliated, he was jeered, and then shortstop Pee Wee Reese came over and stood next to him and put his arm around him, and they faced the crowd together. The fans grew quiet, and Robinson later said that that arm around his shoulder saved his career. It took encouragement from his teammates to rise above his circumstances. Worship need not be a lonely experience. We need each other. Eric Metaxas in his book, Seven Men and the Secret of Their Greatness, writes, it was Robinson's deep faith in Christ that challenged him to be the first player to break the color barrier. He also states that Jackie Robinson was attracted to Branch Rickey, the general manager who also shared his deep faith in deep faith in Christ. Not only does worship refocus our circumstances, it reframes our circumstances. Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, wrote in his book Man's Search for Meaning, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms. 
to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Viktor Frankl was in prison. We may feel like we've been in prison this last year. Paul and Silas were in prison. Their bodies may have been chained, but they chose to let their spirits soar in worship. Roger, we don't know what kind of singing voices Paul and Silas had. They may not have had the greatest voices. They may have sung out of tune, but they sang with conviction. So let's read what happened because Paul and Silas chose to worship. We're going to finish this passage by picking it up in verse 26. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and the entire household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. How many of you remember where you were during the earthquake of 2011 here in the Washington, D.C. area? I remember exactly where I was. I was in my office talking to a young mom from Groveton Church about launching a weekday uh, mother's Bible study. She immediately dropped the phone and went to check on her infant son. The bobblehead dolls on my uh, bookshelf uh, bobbled off and fell on the floor. When we woke up that morning, we were not prepared for an earthquake. Those who uh, took care of the National Cathedral and who were in the Washington Monument that day weren't prepared for an earthquake. Paul and Silas and the other prisoners were not prepared for the earthquake. The jailer was not prepared for an earthquake. But right on cue, an earthquake shook the jail. Many times, prisoners were personally responsible for the prisoners. So the jailer was ready to take his own life if the prisoners had escaped. It had been a no good, very bad day. But God's will broke through during a desperate situation. The earthquake was not about freeing the prisoners. It was about delivering the jailer. God used the circumstances of a no good, very bad day to allow a jailer and his family to have their lives changed forever. For anyone in this room today or anyone watching at home, God can use this no good, very bad day or this no good, very bad year to bring us in to right relationship with Jesus Christ. The jailer's life had been spared. Now he wanted to know how he could be saved. Perhaps the jailer had heard Paul preach. Perhaps he had heard the little girl's proclamation. Perhaps he had listened to their singing and praying late into the night. The jailer was now ready to make his commitment to Christ. And Paul and Silas' words to the jailer were simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. The jailer's family enters the picture. We don't know how or when. The details of the story are limited, but... Perhaps they lived at the jail. Perhaps they ran to check on their father and husband. Whatever the reason, the whole family came to faith in Christ. The jailer's life had been changed. Instead of beating Paul and Silas, he now washed their wounds. And the jailer and his family received a washing. They were baptized. 
And the change in the jailer's behavior demonstrated his new faith in Christ. The jailer no longer saw them as prisoners, but he treats Paul and Silas as brothers in Christ. Christ used Paul and Silas' pain for good. God never wants to waste our pain. God can use our pain, our bad days, for his good. February 27th, 1991. It was the height of the Desert Storm War. Ruth Dillow received the news a mom never wants to receive. Her son, Clayton Carpenter, private first class, had stepped on a landmine. He was dead. For the next day, she grieved and mourned. People tried to comfort her, but her grief, of course, was deep and raw. And then three days after the notification of his death, the phone rang. She picked it up on the other end, and the voice said, Mom, it's your son. I'm alive. She didn't believe it at first. She thought somebody was trying to play a cruel joke. But the more he spoke, she realized it truly was her son's voice. And he was alive. She laughed and cried and she rejoiced. What seemed like a hopeless situation was radically transformed. You see, she had received incorrect information. Maybe we've recently received incorrect information. Because you see, Jesus Christ wants to change our no good, very bad days into good days. Life changing days. In the depth of our worst situations in life, I believe we have an opportunity to experience God in an intimacy that we've never experienced before. In the worst situations in life, we can experience a closeness with God that we've never experienced before. But like Paul and Silas, we must allow God to move in and be close to us. Would you pray with me? Father, in this room and those listening from home, I know there are many who are even this day experiencing one of those terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. But Father, we thank you that you do want to move in and, and to change our lives. Father, you want us to experience us and experience you in a way that we've never experienced before. So, Father, there may be some listening today who have never made that commitment to Christ. And, and many others who need to take a step forward of trusting you more deeply in their life. And, Father, we thank you that you are that life-changing kind of God. We ask, thank you for that in your name. Amen.